You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. Um, I guess today we're going to be a, uh, from two different companies, Phoenix and Shine. Uh, one of them couldn't make it because of travel, but it's okay. We've got uh, Evan Singbush, a uh, PhD, is an MBA, and he's the president of Phoenix, and who was also supposed to attend, but uh, we'll, you know, the collaboration will still stand. We'll still talk about it. It was Greg Pfeiffer, the founder and CEO of Shine Medical. We're going to talk about their new collaboration. So, Evan, thanks for coming, first of all. Hey, Richard. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, if you don't mind, uh, tell me a little bit about Shine from what you know and a little bit about Phoenix, and then what's this collaboration about? Sure, absolutely. So, um, uh, Shine uh, spun out of Phoenix uh, back in 2010 uh, to focus on one specific uh, application of the Phoenix technology, which is is medical isotope production. And so... While we're still, you know, very close as companies, we are two separate entities. Um, you know, at Phoenix, we make essentially particle accelerators uh, that generate a lot of neutrons. Uh, Shine is ultimately uh, a customer of ours that will be using those neutron generators uh, to produce medical isotopes that are used in nuclear medicine imaging procedures. So. Um, these are, um, you know, radioisotopes that are used in diagnostic tests in medicine to detect cancer, you know, heart disease, and you know, a hundred other different uh, indications. Uh, there's one specific isotope uh, that Shine will be manufacturing uh, using the Phoenix technology called uh, molybdenum 99, uh, which is really the workhorse of, of nuclear medicine. It's used in uh, more than one procedure every second. Uh, around the world, so it works out to uh, you know over 30 million procedures a year uh, rely wow. on this key isotope, um, and and right now it's it's only produced in a few remaining nuclear uh, reactors around the world. Uh, there's actually no production sites left in the Western Hemisphere, and and so really the mission of Shine, and of course a uh, big part of Phoenix's business is kind of filling that gap as uh, reactors age and shut down, and and we lose supply of this this vital uh, medical uh, supply. Okay, so an isotope is, to my understanding, an atom uh, that has uh, excess neutrons causing it to be unstable and to radioactively decay in some fashion. Is that right? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, molybdenum-99, or, or MOLLE for short, um, it, it decays into another uh, material, an isotope called technetium-99M. M means metastable. And essentially what, what it means is this: the, these materials are are radioactive, um, meaning that um, they are constantly decaying and emitting radiation. In particular, uh, they're emitting something uh, called a gamma ray, which is basically a, a photon. So it's a form of light, kind of like an X-ray. Um, and what you can do is you can take these isotopes, uh, you can attach them to molecules um, that like to go to certain areas of the body. So you can attach them to glucose uh, for instance, uh, which will go into the heart muscles. Um, and then the materials, as they're attached to the heart muscle, will be emitting this, these gamma rays, this radiation. And you can use a special camera, uh, something that looks kind of like an X-ray detector, uh, and you can detect the gamma rays coming out of uh, you know, the body and uh, get basically an image of the distribution of this isotope in the body. And that can give you an indication of the functionality of your heart, for instance, and, and diagnose, you know, whether you've had a heart attack or if you're going to have a heart attack. Um, you know, the other big indication is, is it's very good at detecting cancer. So, you know, cancerous cells are dividing more rapidly than normal cells. 
Uh, they use up uh, sort of more, you know, again, to use the, the sugar analog glucose than other cells. And so they'll kind of show up as a brighter spot on the image from the camera than, than normal tissue. And this is one of many tools that are used uh, very regularly to detect, uh, you know, cancer uh, in, in the body. Well, uh, what are some of the factors that are important in making this as safe as possible? I mean, it doesn't sound very good, you know, obviously to have gamma radiation, uh, you know, in your body, coming out of your body. So, you know, the choice of atom substrate or template, I guess, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, the, the amount of gamma rays that are coming out, uh, how are all these factors important? How do they boil in? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the good news is, is you know, this, 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 t this type of uh, medical procedure has been done for, for decades. Um, you know, this is not a new procedure. It's very well understood, and, and it's actually very safe. The, the reason it's so safe is that the quantities of radioactive material we're talking about here are absolutely uh, minuscule. So to put it in perspective, um, you know, the Shine facility, which is currently being built uh, about 45 minutes south of here in Janesville, Wisconsin, uh, you know, this is a big nuclear grade facility, uh, you know, total investment is, you know, I think, uh, you know, north of a quarter of a billion dollars. Um, so a lot of money going in, there's a lot of big, you know, hardware, there's going to be eight uh, Phoenix neutron sources running this plant, it's essentially going to operate 24 hours a day, 50 weeks a year. Um, and the total output of useful material in a year from that production facility will be about a half of a sugar packet's worth of material. Um, and that half of a sugar packet will be divided up into uh, about 15 million different individual patient doses all around the world. So, you know, you can imagine taking half a sugar packet and slicing it up uh, into 15 million pieces, and that's the quantity that goes into any individual patient for one of these tests. So the quantities of material we're talking about here are very, very small, such that the dose, uh, the radiation dose that, that any you know, individual patient gets is actually, you know, uh, very, very small. And, you know, the risk from having a just minuscule amount of radiation compared to the, to the benefit of the diagnostic procedure um, is, is quite obvious, and it has been done for a long time. Um, you know, the real challenge is you know, being able to produce, um, transport uh, the, the isotopes in, in a safe and, and economically effective way. And so historically, the only way that people have, have known how to do this is to use uh, nuclear reactors. And in fact, most of the nuclear reactors that have made this stuff uh, use highly enriched uranium, uh, which, which the U.S. government can, you know, considers to be a, a weapons threat because this is, uh, you know, material that could uh, if, you know, got into the wrong hands, be, be turned into a bomb. And so, you know, one of the ways that Phoenix and Shine got started is we were an awardee of a $25 million uh, cooperative agreement from the U.S. Department of Energy back in 2010 uh, that was geared towards developing a way to produce this key medical isotope in a way that does not use highly enriched uranium um, and also just developing a domestic supply in the U.S. And so, you know, our concept in contrast to using a nuclear reactor with lots of uranium and all the regulatory burden that goes along with it, um, we're actually using a particle accelerator. Uh, so, you know, accelerating a beam of ions, uh, not radioactive, um, using those to generate uh, neutrons, which sort of serve as the, the catalyst uh, for a reaction that does use some radioactive material, but a thousand times lower quantities of, of radioactive material than a reactor uses, which means that for us, the, the licensing and regulatory path is much simpler. Uh, we generate a thousand times less waste uh, than, a, than a reactor. And then the benefit for you know, the US, which uses about half of the global supply of Molly 99, uh, is that we're, we're closer to the end users in the hospitals um, you know, one of the challenges with this radioactive material is that because it's radioactive, it's it's disappearing uh, constantly. So uh, you lose about one percent of your product every single hour. Uh, so the minute it's produced, you're already starting to lose it. So you know, one of the big producers, for example, is in Australia. Uh, shipping this stuff from Australia to the U.S., uh, you lose about a third of your product just through the the decay during the shipping process. So that's another so advantage we'll have being a, a local yeah. producer. Is the half-life then what about 48 hours? Uh, 66 hours. Okay. All right. So again, for listeners, that's the amount of time it takes for half the radioactivity of the material to uh, have dissipated, right? 
Yep, yep, that's exactly right. Well, so what can you say about the process of creating Molly 99? And I'm sure maybe all of it's proprietary, I don't know. But what can you say about it? Maybe can you give a little bit more detail on how it's made, just out of curiosity? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there are parts of it that are proprietary, but I think the general concept, uh, certainly I can talk to. So, you know, the, the approach that we're taking uh, is actually um, a hybrid that combines both nuclear fusion and, uh, and nuclear fission. Uh, so nuclear, you know, what, what most people are familiar with is, is nuclear fission. This is where you take a, a material like uranium or plutonium, and you're basically splitting the atom in half uh, or into pieces. And when you do that, you, you release energy. Um, one of the challenges with, uh, with fission is that it does result in these very long-lived waste products. So these are radioactive materials that might have half-lives you know, of a million years or more, meaning they're, uh, you know, a pretty significant uh, disposal uh, challenge just because it takes a very long time for them them to go away. Uh, nuclear fusion um, is sort of the opposite. So nuclear fusion, you're basically taking two light elements. Um, in our case, we're actually taking two different isotopes of hydrogen, uh, and we're basically smashing them together to create uh, a new um, uh, atom. In this case, it's helium. Um, but one of the byproducts of that reaction is a free uh, neutron. So we, you know, smash these two uh, hydrogen atoms together, uh, you know, create helium, and then we release a free neutron. And that free neutron is sort of the useful thing um, that Phoenix makes. And so sort of the core innovation from Phoenix's perspective is we've developed an accelerator technology that's just much higher output um, than has been available in the past. And so you know, when we operate one of our systems, we're generating something like uh, 10 trillion uh, neutrons uh, per second, you know, on that, on that order. So just a really high quantity of neutrons. And then what we do is we couple that fusion neutron source um, with what's called a subcritical assembly, uh, which is basically, a, it's basically a, a liquid bath of low enriched uranium dissolved in water. Um, and the neutrons that we created with our particle accelerator then go out, they interact with the, the low enriched uranium in the water, which is not, you know, weapons grade. Uh, and when those neutrons smash into the uranium, they split the uranium up. And, you know, 6% of the time when you break uranium in half, the byproduct is, is Molly 99, which is really the, the useful material. And so the, uh, the Shine facility um, will actually have eight uh, sort of redundant systems that look like this. So you'll have eight Phoenix particle accelerators coupled with these subcritical assemblies, each of which will be uh, generating substantial quali uh, quantities of these uh, medical isotopes. Okay, so you create the Molly 99. Um, just going back to the, the part where it's in the human body, how do you uh, characterize the amount of radiation? Is it like in millisieverts or microsieverts or millicuries or and what are the approximate levels? Yeah, so, um, you know, millicuries uh, would be sort of a dose a quantity of radioactive material uh, that goes into the body. Um, I think, you know, a typical dose is, I think it's down in the microcuries um, for a typical technetium uh, scan. And then, of course, you can also measure the radioactivity, um, you know, coming out of, a, you know, a person that gets one of those procedures that would be measured in, you know, either you know, microsieverts or millirem, uh, which are effectively the, the, the same unit. Um, again, the doses are, you know, I don't know off the top of my head uh, what a typical dose to a patient is, but it's, you know, far, far below any type of regulatory limit or any, you know, level where there'd be concern um, that there's a serious health impact. Um, you know, maybe a good analog would be, you know, I think people are maybe more familiar with a CT scan uh, where you're essentially using you know, an x-ray machine to, to look through a human, uh, you certainly get uh, sort of more dose um, from a typical CT scan, more radiation dose than you would from uh, many of these nuclear medicine procedures that utilize a radioactive isotope. And again, the reason for this is, um, you know, the, the reason Molly 99 is, is such a special isotope is that the, the type of gamma radiation that comes off of it is sort of the perfect uh, energy for this type of procedure. So it's it's a high enough energy that the gamma ray basically is emitted and goes through your body with minimal interaction in your tissue. 
uh, but it's low enough energy that once it gets out of your body, you're able to detect it with high efficiency um, with these, you know, gamma cameras is what they're called, uh, which is basically the detector that you use. And, and so ultimately what that means is you don't need to use very much of this material at all uh, to get a high quality image. Um, and, you know, the secondary effect is that the amount of radiation that the patient gets is, is minuscule. Yeah, I had a, a family member that had uh, the iodine 131, which was very different. That was, you know, I don't know 80, 100 millicurie dose and, you know, she had to stay away from people for 10 or 11 days. And, you know, I guess it was a different, totally different story, much higher, uh, higher dosage, but a little bit of similarity, I guess. Yeah, no, definitely. And in fact, iodine-131 is another isotope that Shine will be making um, at, at their facility. The difference between what um, your family member had and the traditional Molly 99 procedure is typically iodine-131 is used as a, a therapeutic isotope. So this is when somebody's already been diagnosed with a disease and they're actually trying to treat, uh, oftentimes it's thyroid cancer, um, using a radioactive material. So now you're actually trying to use the radioactive material to kill the cancer, meaning the doses are much, much higher. And there certainly is, um, you know, uh, re- you know there, there is dose to normal tissue that is undesired, but of course you have to weigh that risk against, you know, leaving the cancer uh, there. So it, it's a very different situation when you're using these isotopes for therapy uh, versus as a diagnostic procedure where the quantities are, are significantly less. Uh, however, right, you know, exactly. I would say that there is, um, you know, there's a growing interest um, in using uh, different isotopes uh, in what people would call targeted uh, molecular uh, radioisotope therapy, where it's similar to iodine, but as you know, the the biologists get better and better at coming up with molecules that can target cancerous cells and not normal tissue. Uh, you can attach radioactive isotopes to those molecules that accumulate in cancerous cells. And if you can really localize the presence of the material only in the tumor and not in normal tissue, uh, this can represent a pretty uh, impactful uh, type of cancer therapy uh, if if you can localize that radiation dose only to the cancerous cells and and not to the normal tissue. So there's a lot of research being done in that space uh, currently, and it's sort of an up-and-coming treatment modality for cancer. What, what's the big goal of, of, of Phoenix here? Is it to reestablish production of Molly 99 in the U.S. and be one of the few remaining providers, or is it to figure out new isotopes, or is it a new method of making Molly? Like, what, what would you say the focus is? Yeah, so it, this is where you kind of need to distinguish a little bit between Shine and Phoenix, and that our missions are a little bit different. So, Shine's uh, you know primary mission is to become the global leader in manufacturing Molly 99 uh, in a way that does not require a nuclear reactor. Um, So it is a new production uh, technique. And then beyond that, they are also looking to produce other isotopes. They, in fact, recently made an announcement um, that they have a new program in place to start producing an isotope called lutetium-177, which is one of those sort of up-and-coming therapeutic isotopes. So there's a there's a drug on the market that's uh, currently been approved uh, that uses lutetium for certain types of cancer therapy. Uh, prostate cancer is one of the big indications that people are looking at. Um, so that, that's really Shine's focus. Phoenix's focus is a little bit different in that, you know, our specialty is really making these very high output uh, neutron sources. So for us, the medical application um, is only one of several different applications that we're pursuing. So we're also utilizing these neutron sources to do uh, industrial imaging, uh, for instance. So we just opened up a new uh, neutron imaging facility here in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, where we'll be inspecting things like turbine blades that go in the middle um, of an aircraft engine. And so this is, you can think of it kind of like an x-ray inspection. Uh, You know, the turbine blades are a good example in that effectively what neutrons are really good at doing is penetrating high density material Uh, like metal and visualizing low density stuff. Um, And in this particular case, what we're looking for is is, uh, ceramic material that can get sort of caught in the cooling channels of these turbine blades as part of the manufacturing process. And so, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but in the middle of a jet engine, when you're up, you know, next time flying on an airplane, looking out the window at the engine, uh, the middle of that engine is operating at about 1300 degrees uh, Celsius, which is about the temperature of molten lava, 
Um, it's in fact higher than the melting point of the the metal that the turbine blades are made of. And so, oh wow, the only thing that yeah, the only thing that keeps these blades from you know essentially melting and you know uh, self destructing is by very very good active uh, cooling through these you know complex cooling channels that are formed through the middle of these blades. Um, and if you have a, just a tiny bit of residual ceramic material um, from the manufacturing process, it can cause a localized hot spot that in a worst case you know, scenario would melt the blade, take an engine down and, and potentially take a plane down. Um, and, and neutrons historically are really the only um, way that you can detect this type of ceramic material because they're the only um, thing that's able to penetrate the metal and visualize the low density material. So historically, uh, this has been done at nuclear reactors for decades, um, and Phoenix is really the first company to have developed a technology that um, uh, allows you to do this same technique without uh, the use of uh, of a nuclear reactor. So, you know, that's one example of another use of the Phoenix technology. Um, but very broadly, we're looking to replace uh, the use of nuclear reactors for a broad range of different applications, uh, like non-destructive testing, uh, as I mentioned. Um, we're also in involved with some commercial and government partners on uh, uh, developing fusion energy uh, systems. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of investment of late um, sort of both in the public sector and, and privately in new fusion energy generation uh, technologies. You know, the joke is that every uh, billionaire has a fusion company that they've invested in, but you know, it's, it's true. You know, the Bezoses and Gateses of the world all have invested substantial money um, in new fusion energy uh, startups. And one of the challenges for those fusion energy companies is that all fusion reaction co uh, reactor concepts will generate lots of neutrons. Um, and it's unclear that we have properly engineered materials to withstand the very high neutron fluxes. And so one of the tools that Phoenix can provide these companies and government labs are these very high output neutron sources that will allow them to characterize the subsystems that will need to operate um, in these future energy sources under these high uh, neutron flux environments. Is a, is a neutron a neutron a neutron, or are there different subtle types of them, or do they have different attributes that could distinguish them when they're produced? Yeah, good, that's a great question. So uh, a neutron is a neutron is a neutron. However, there's an important attribute uh, that is very meaningful, which is the energy of the neutron has a big impact uh, in terms of how it interacts with the uh, material. And so, uh, for instance, when you think about the, the fusion energy react, uh, reactors, most of the concepts utilize a reaction known as the DT reaction, which stands for deuterium tritium. Uh, these are the two isotopes of hydrogen that I mentioned earlier. So th these are kind of the, the easiest elements that nature has provided us uh, for nuclear uh, fusion. Um, however, one of the sort of downsides is that when you uh, have a DT uh, fusion reaction, which releases a lot of energy, it also releases a, a, a neutron that has high, relatively high energy. So 14 mega electron volts, um, 14 million electron volts is the, the amount of energy that a neutron has that comes off of a DT reaction. And those high energy neutrons are particularly damaging to materials and electronic circuits. And so in order to appropriately test um, you know, computer systems and materials in these high neutron flux environments, not only do you need a lot of neutrons, but you need neutrons of the right uh, energy. And so the fact that, that we at Phoenix inherently utilize the same nuclear fusion reaction that these reactor concepts are looking at mean that we produce not only a lot of neutrons, but the right energy of neutrons to do this type of testing. Is the amount of energy a neutron has quantized? And could you put, you know, when you do a reaction, can you run the neutrons that come out of it through a filter that would exclude certain energies, only allow other energies through? In some circumstances, you can do that at very low neutron energies, but generally, no. Um, so, you know, you can slow neutrons down by letting them bounce off material, but it's very difficult to select sort of a specific energy band. Um, so, you know, one of the, the, the process of slowing neutrons down is called thermalization or moderation. And effectively, what you do is you just let the neutrons bounce around in, in some media often, you know, graphite is used or heavy water or polyethylene or even regular water is actually a decent uh, neutron moderator. The challenge is you can't say, you know, I'm going to use this amount of material and take my neutrons from 14 MeV down to 7 MeV. 
uh, what happens is it's kind of a random process. So you end up with this very broad uh, energy spectrum of neutrons. So it's, it's difficult to sort of use moderation uh, to get to a specific uh, desired neutron energy spectrum. Um, to, to your initial question, um, it, the, the neutron energy isn't necessarily quantized, but depending on the reaction, there's a pretty narrow band of neutrons that are born from that reaction. So, you know, I mentioned the DT reaction. Pretty much all the neutrons that come out of that reaction have about 14 MeV. Not exactly. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a band there, but it's, it's right in that range. You know, another common fusion reaction is the DD reaction, deuterium, deuterium. Those neutrons are all born with about two and a half uh, MeV of energy, for instance. And then there are other reactions that create neutrons where there's a whole broad range of neutron energies as opposed to sort of a single uh, energy line. Once neutrons are produced, can you keep them, like magnetically keep them in, constrained in a bottle and make like a soup of, of neutrons? Or once you make them, you have to use them right away? Unfortunately, you cannot keep your neutrons around. Yeah, once you make them, you have to use them right away. So, um, you know, because neutrons are inherently neutral, hence their name, um, you know, they don't interact with uh, magnetic fields or electric fields um, because they don't have charge. And so there's really no way to put them in a, a storage ring or something like that. So you essentially have to, to use them immediately once you've made them um, Essentially, if you don't, they're they're gone, you know, nearly instantaneously on a time scale of, you know, milliseconds, which is, uh, you know, a challenge, but it's also a benefit. So, you know, that's one of the, you know, the benefits of the, the Phoenix and the Shine approach for medical isotope production, for instance, is that there's an inherent safety benefit that the minute that we switch off our machine uh, and it's literally, you know, press a button on the keyboard or click a mouse uh, you know, turns the machine off. The minute we do that, the radiation goes away, which is very different than a nuclear reactor where you have lots of radioactive material and it's actually operating in a sort of self-sustained reaction. This is known as criticality. Um, and so I, I mentioned earlier, we use a type of um, process called a subcritical reaction. And what that means is that we we develop the process in such a way that it can never uh, there could never be a meltdown because it is not a uh, it's not a self-sustaining reaction. The mi the minute we flip flip the off switch, uh, all the radiation goes away in a matter of, of milliseconds. So there's a great safety benefit uh, to using these accelerator-based systems in comparison to um, you know traditional uh, reactor techniques. Is there any way to generate neutrons and have them you know collide with other atoms that have let's say a longer half-life? that would then consequently re-emit neutrons just maybe at a slower rate or a more predictable rate. And by that way, you, you're essentially harvesting them and building them up for a later time. Is that a technique or is that just growing speculation? No, not, another good question. Yeah, so th there are radioactive materials that are neutron emitters um, that uh, can effectively be kind of, you know, a, 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 you know, a storage source for no neutrons, if you will. A good example uh, would be an isotope called Californium-252. Um, and this is, in fact, uh, an example of another um, isotope that we're actively replacing the use of Californium-252 with our neutron sources. And, and the reason for that is these materials that are radioactive and emit neutrons are, are actually pretty dangerous in that, uh, again, there, there's sort of no way uh, to press the off button um, and they're also very difficult to produce. So uh, there's only two places in the world um, that make Californium-252. There's a, a nuclear reactor in, in, at Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee, uh, and there's a reactor in Russia. Um, those are the only two places that make this stuff. And in order to make it, uh, you have to go through 14 different elemental transmutations before you end up with Californium-252. So it's an incredibly difficult uh, process, uh, requires very, very specialized and unique resources. And then once you've made it, uh, it's a very dangerous substance to handle because it's constantly emitting uh, sort of high levels of, of neutron radiation. And so this touches on another application of the Phoenix technology. Um, we're currently building and in fact recently just installed our first um, neutron-based system to inspect nuclear fuel um, that goes into nuclear reactors that generate uh, electricity. So 
uh, you know, a typical reactor that, that, you know, generates electricity. And right now in the U.S., for example, about 20 percent uh, of the electrical grid is powered by nuclear. Uh, these reactors have to be refueled uh, about every 18 months. So every year and a half, they'll put new fuel uh, in. And one of the key characteristics of the fuel is the enrichment. Uh, so enrichment is, you know, the ratio of uranium-235, which is the sort of useful stuff, uh, to the uranium-238, uh, which is the sort of non-radioactive um, uranium that, that's just sort of the background material. And so the, the, the reactors are designed with a very specific enrichment profile. And so the nuclear fuel um, that is manufactured to go refuel these reactors has to be tested to ensure that it has the right enrichment distribution. Uh, otherwise, you can end up with a localized hot spot if you have a higher enriched uh, you know, fuel pellet um, versus the design, it could cause the, the rod to leak. You have radioactive material in your cooling water, and you know, this could very quickly be a you know, $100 million type of disaster. So historically, what people have done is they've used Californium-252, this neutron emitting isotope, uh, to inspect the nuclear fuel. Uh, by sh basically, you shoot neutrons at the fuel. When the neutrons hit the uranium, it emits radiation in the form of gamma rays. You can measure those gamma rays and essentially the number of gamma rays that you count is indicative of the enrichment of the fuel. Uh, however, for the reasons I talked about before, uh, people really don't like to deal with Californium-252 because it's a big regulatory hazard, it's difficult to get, it's very, very expensive. Um, and so we're in the process of transitioning most of the major nuclear fuel manufacturers away from Californium-252 uh, to basically an electronic machine that looks more like you know, an X-ray system that has an on and an off switch that can produce the same number of neutrons that they're used to using with uh, with the Californium. How, how, uh, are there any applications in which neutrons are produced and then shot at a substance to do diagnostics? Like, you know, in the engine example, to test for the presence of ceramics, like how would you use neutrons to do that? And what are some other ways that neutrons can be used? Like, you know, have you guys, I'm sure you guys have thought through like every way possible you could and how they could be used. So, and other examples? Yeah, absolutely. So another good example would be um, uh, there in um, like satellites and spacecraft, uh, there's a lot of small energetic charges. Energetic is just another word, I guess, for explosive that are used to like, you know, separate the stages of the booster or, you know, deploy the satellite once it gets up into the upper atmosphere. Um, There's a very niche market that most people aren't familiar with, but there can be, you know, hundreds or even thousands of these small explosive charges that are used as part of the either the launch process or the deployment or a lot of different parts of, of, of space travel. Um, and of course, these are very um, sort of mission critical systems where uh, if they fail, um, you know, the cost of failure is high in that, you know, if you're you know, billion dollar satellite doesn't deploy correctly, you know, that's a lot of money down the drain. And so people invest a lot of money on inspecting these types of components to ensure um, that they were manufactured appropriately. Um, and neutron inspection is one of the key techniques to do that. Because again, you're uh, sort of facing the situation where often these components have a lot of metal around the outside and you have to be able to see through that metal and visualize these very small quantities um, of energetic material to essentially ensure that they don't have any cracks or voids or discontinuities or bubbles um, in the energetic fill. And you, you essentially can't do this with any other inspection technique. X-rays uh, you know, can't penetrate the metal and they won't visualize the energetic material. Ultrasound doesn't work. Um, you know, none of the other techniques can really do this uh, other than um, neutron imaging. And so historically, this has been done uh, at just a handful of reactors um, around the country and, and outside of the country. But one of the challenges is that, you know, we haven't really been building nuclear reactors in this country for, uh, you know, 50 years now. And so most of the places that used to do this are, you know, have either been decommissioned or they're approaching uh, the end of their life. And so there really, you know, is sort of a looming crisis for the people that make turbine blades and these energetic components and, and a range of other components um, where they're going to lose access to neutrons as these reactors to continue to shut down. Um, and one of our objectives as a company is to basically fill that gap and provide an alternative source of neutrons uh, to ensure continued quality of these types of components that are used in 
uh, you know, primarily aerospace um, applications. Yeah, I thought there was um, a new breed of nuclear reactors coming online that used, you know, instead of solid cooling rods, liquid ones, and, you know, they were much higher tech and safer. Is that not going to take the place of existing nuclear plants? Not for this type of application. So what, what I think what you're talking about are uh, what's commonly known as SMRs or uh, small modular reactors, which I you know, personally am, am a huge uh, supporter of. And there's a lot of people doing a lot of really good work on this, uh, on this type of stuff. However, those reactors are inherently designed um, to produce energy. Uh, they're really not designed to produce neutrons for these other applications. And just the sort of the geometry of the way these systems are manufactured make it impossible to gain access to the neutrons that are produced because they're essentially all you know, bottled up in, in this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, giant enclosure uh, that's used to produce energy. And so I guess I should have specified, you know, these, these reactors that I mentioned that are aging and going away that are used for these aerospace inspections, these are not the same reactors that generate uh, electricity. It's a different class of reactor, typically called a research reactor. So they're smaller reactors, they have a very different geometry, and they have these specialized, uh, what are called beam lines, and they're you know basically long ports that give you direct access to the core of the nuclear reactor, which is where uh, the neutrons come from. Uh, that same concept just doesn't exist in a traditional power reactor, um, and, and it won't in the new SMRs either. All right, got it. And then <clears throat> just a couple more questions, just backtracking a little bit. So if you are going to be diagnosing, you, know, you said like for certain materials, you can't use x-rays, you can't use anything but neutrons to, I guess, look at the structure of it. What are you doing there? You're shooting neutrons at an object and the ones that don't collide that come through create a pattern on the other side, which tells you the structure of the object or how does that work? Yep. You, you got it exactly right. It's uh, it's very analogous to sort of the way x-rays work. So, um, you know, there's a couple different flavors of it. The most basic is just a simple transmission image, meaning you've got a, a neutron source on one side of your object that you're inspecting. Uh, the neutrons pass through that object. Some of them are absorbed by the object. Some of them are not. Uh, the ones that make it through will hit a detector. Um, you know, this could be old school film um, or, you know, more commonly these days, um, uh, some type of digital detector that can detect those neutrons. And then ultimately you end up with a picture um, that shows you the internal structure um, of that object through which the image, uh, through which the neutrons passed. Uh, sort of the next step for that is to do 3D imaging or tomography. Uh, and we're in fact being funded uh, currently by the Army uh, to develop some uh, neutron tomography uh, here at our facility uh, in Madison. And in that case, you're basically taking a number of different uh, of these transmission images from different angles, uh, and then you use sort of computerized reconstruction software to take all of that data and generate a three-dimensional uh, image of the interior of the object. So it's basically the same way that a medical CT scan works for a person. Uh, but in this case, rather than using x-rays, we're using neutrons. And rather than looking at people, uh, we're looking at, you know, a rocket motor, uh, for instance, amongst, you know, many other types of components. Um, and then to take it even one step uh, further, uh, one of the things we're also currently being funded by the government to develop is uh, a, basically a neutron x-ray fusion imaging technique, uh, where we'd basically be taking an image of a component with neutrons and x-rays at the same time. Um, and, and in this case, it's a three-dimensional image. Um, and, and basically what you get out of that is because neutrons and x-rays interact with material very differently, they both provide sort of complementary uh, but distinct information about what's inside your part. Um, and, and so by, by using both neutrons and x-rays, you can get this sort of hybrid image, um, which gives you a really unique view um, to the inside of what you're looking at. We think of this as being very analogous uh, to what's commonly done in medicine uh, with PET, uh, positron emission tomography, and CT, uh, computed tomography. Uh, so these are two common imaging procedures that are used um, in medicine these days where you'll do a, a CT scan of a person. This is, you know, using x-rays to uh, you know, shoot it through the body, and you're basically getting information about the anatomy of the person. So you'll see the bone and the tissue, and you can create a three-dimensional image. Uh, and then at the same time, or maybe right afterwards, 
You'll also do a PET scan, positron emission tomography, which gives you functional information about the person. So things like you know, blood flow and uh, metabolism within the person. And then you can combine those two images to create a hybrid image, which is sort of more powerful than either image on its own. Uh, and we're trying to take a the similar approach with neutrons and x-rays for some of these, uh, you know, um, very challenging industrial applications. Yeah, I was just thinking of that. If I, if I had to go for a scan and I could get a PET and an MRI and a CT all in one, the doctors would probably see a lot more and it would be less time and it would really be great if you could do something like that, plus x-rays, you know. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that is the direction things are moving. So there are, uh, you know, hybrid scanners in existence today that can do both uh, PET and, uh, and CT. Um, I don't think there's the trifecta yet that includes MRI as well. But, you know, absolutely, the, the more diagnostic information you're able to get, um, you know, the better job the, the physicians are able to do, do in terms of determining, you know, what's wrong and, and uh, prescribing the appropriate uh, treatment course. So how long until other sources, other neutron suppliers go, hey, what's the, um, the amount of time you think you have until there's going to be a big need for your stuff? I, we're, we're already there. Uh, it, it's basically already happened. So, um, you know, if you think about the, the medical isotope production application, uh, the last reactor in the Western Hemisphere that was producing Molly 99 uh, shut down in, in 2018. Um, and, and so there have already been major shortages of this isotope uh, because these reactors have unexpected outages, you know, pipe breaks, whatever. Um, and they could go down for weeks or months at a time. And, and this has already happened uh, several times over the last you know, decade or so. And what this means is wh when those reactors are down, because you can't stockpile Molly 99 because it's always uh, decaying away, uh, there are shortages of this isotope, which means that patients uh, can't get the diagnostic procedures that they need. And physicians have to rely on sort of a plan B procedure, which is not as effective. So uh, this is really one of the things that sort of spurred the investment from the Department of Energy back in the you know 2009 timeframe. Uh, the the first major shortage of isotopes from reactors going down was way back in 2006, uh, and that's been repeated many times over. And it's only getting worse um, now that there's less and less reactors producing this. I think there's only four remaining reactors in the world um, that make this isotope. So. The crisis in, in some ways is sort of already upon us. Um, you know, the good news is that our production facility is already being built. Um, you know, uh, Shine was issued its uh, construction permit from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission a couple years ago. Uh, this was the first such permit that's been issued since 1960. Um, so it's been a very long time since this type of facility has been built. Um, and in fact, our uh, operating license was docketed uh, by the NRC just a couple months ago. Uh, which means we're on track to be com commercially uh, producing isotopes by 2022. Um, on the other side, you know, the, the industrial application, uh, there's only uh, basically three places left in the United States, nuclear reactors that provide neutrons uh, for this, uh, you know, imaging and non-destructive inspection applications uh, that we've touched on. And there's one place left in Canada. Uh, one of those reactors is is likely going to go down in, in 2021, um, and the others are not far behind. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty urgent need, and uh, we're working uh, very hard to be able to fill those gaps uh, uh, when they open up. Well, very good. Well, Evan, what's the best way for people to find out more about Phoenix and Shine? Uh, website's probably the easiest. So um, uh, phoenixwi.com is the Phoenix website, and there's lots of information on, on the various applications um, that we've talked about here and, and on the technology as well. Uh, and then Shine is uh, shinemed.com um, uh, is their website as well, or you know, probably easiest to find us by Google. Shouldn't be uh, tough to find either of us. And um, uh, yeah. Right. Evan, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, great discussion. I appreciate you having us on. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now and the companies that are using these technologies for the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. 
you may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.